Hey everybody, Tommy Norman with the Nashville Blues and Roots Alliance. I've got a great interview for you today with Jackie Vinson, who is a singer, songwriter, musician out of Austin, Texas, known for her fiery and eclectic guitar work. As always, if you want to support the local Blues and Roots community, head on over to bluesandroots.org, sign up to be a member, view all the upcoming events, peruse all of our artists, and more. And now, here's my interview with Jackie Vinson. Hey everybody, I've got a really great uh, guest today that I'm really excited to talk to, Jackie Vincent. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be on here with me. No problem, I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I, this is the National Blues and Roots Alliance, so we're going to start in the blues, but we're going to go a little bit everywhere because I know we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, right. But let's let's start with, you have this very eclectic style, but there is a lot of blues in there, and you're from Austin, Texas which is a blues guitar town. You got, you know, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan, but you've also got like Eric Johnson, Monty Montgomery, all those different folks out of there. You know, tell me who were your early influences that kind of shifted you into the blues from where you started? So I started off with classical piano. I was not a guitar player at all until I was about 21. And that's when I picked it up. And up until then I played only classical piano and every now and then I would venture off from the classical compositions that I was learning to maybe try and write a song because I was also interested in singing like as a teen. Um, I never really got into singing deeply when I was a teen, but I did dabble in it like at a high school talent show or two. <laughs> but I wasn't like, I didn't start getting serious about singing until I started trying to look for work. And it was actually right, right at the time when I picked up the guitar. I picked up the guitar because I didn't like my persona on the piano. Like I would, I would literally write a song or learn a cover and then I would film myself playing it and then I would watch the video and I didn't like it just didn't like it and then no matter what I did if I stood and then I'd stand up I'd be like I don't like it because I'm sitting and I don't like how I'm like my torso is when I'm sitting you know so like I don't like the visual aesthetic of it you know what I mean and so then I'm like okay well I'll stand up and then I'd stand up and then I didn't like my knees like, I, I'm just like there's just like this big thing blocking my whole body and then all you can see is my knees I just didn't like it <laughs> I and the, the keytar never came into the question yeah no it never it's, did it's making a comeback just, just it is it when there. I was teen, it was a pretty huge faux pas <laughs> now I what what I would ask is because I, I read some interviews uh so I I think I saw one that Johnny Lane kind of was one of those ones that you heard and, and really liked is that a I true story? Thought, yeah, for sure. I, I heard Nice and Warm by Johnny Lang when I was like maybe 21 or 22. And that was after I'd already picked up the guitar and I was just looking for guitarists to listen to because all of my friends in college, they all recommended the best place to start learning how to play the guitar is to start listening to guitar players obsessively, like nonstop. So I did that. I took that to heart. And um I found Buddy Guy immediately. They actually just ended up just dropping a bunch of albums on one of my hard drives. And I just like listened to so many, like I listened to like probably 10 BB King albums like on repeat. And then I ended up like finding um, Derek Trucks. I found Jeff Beck. I listened to them on repeat. I, I listened to all the Kings, Albert King, Freddie King, uh, and BB King. I love Albert King. I love Albert King pretty much as much as I love B.B. King. Um, I've just listened to more B.B. King because I think right. they're, I think he has more recordings. He was, really <laughs> so I've just spent more time listening to him because I've just listened to everything he's ever released and he's le released so much. I think the only other person who can compare to how prolific he is is Buddy Guy, who I also have listened to all of. So I was just like three years. All I did was listen to blues guitar players. And um, yeah, it was just like this melting pot of everybody you can imagine, really. But it was heavily Buddy Guy, BB King. I listened to Derek Trucks obsessively for like a year. 
Uh, and then also Jeff Beck. And do you have you have never really seen you play slide? Do you do any slide? Nope. But Is I that... uh, spin strings like crazy. Yeah. No. I I I work on like getting a gain and distortion combination that allows me to sometimes bend the strings in a way to sound like a slide. Right. Because you know I, mean? I, I love Derek. Tre I'm not a slide player either. I've, I could never master that. But I, I love Derek Trex because it's phrasing. You just, you know, it's, it's smooth. That's, there's a lot you can learn from him that doesn't involve you playing slide at all. Well, and also just very much, you know, a lot of us who get, you know, you know, the Steve Ray Vaughn clones, we're all pentatonic minors, you know, and those crazy bends. And at his, his, the melodic side of playing a melody, which I know is a big piece of, of your playing is, is playing with the metal melody and things like that. Yeah. Uh, like thinking about the larger picture of a song and how the guitar solo enhances and adds to the song instead of just like sits in the middle of the song and doesn't make any sense. Like it all has to, right. to make sense to me somehow. And, and I can't really articulate uh, what making sense means. It's just like when you hear it, you right. just know. You just know. And um, yeah, that's a huge thing that I took away from Derek Trucks and Buddy Guy and BB King. They're all extremely melodic players who sometimes get licky. Right. You know, they, just, they take these lick breaks where they're just like, whoa. And then they go right back to doing the melody. They they blend the licks and the melody perfectly. And those are the guitar players I gravitate to because I just feel like anybody can do the licks hit. Right. Just well, and, and like anybody can do it. And BB King, you know, when you look at BB King, I mean, his stuff was not super technical. He stayed in you know the box a lot, and it would yeah. just be you know he could just play those two or three notes that would just sing, and that yeah, vib that vibrato. Sometimes he'd rip though. He could. He could. You, you dig into his like, especially his earlier stuff, like right. before he was seventy and eighty. Like everybody's like always only listening to him like after nineteen ninety. I'm like, no, <laughs> listen to BB King from like nineteen seventy one, or even the early stuff, like Three O'clock Blues and stuff like that. The early stuff. Hell out of you, man. You'll you'll think it, this is Buddy Guy because you're hearing this like frantic guitar playing, like, and it's BB King just ripping as like a thirty year old man. You know, like everybody who has only just loosely listened to BB King, they've probably only heard his later recordings. They haven't heard his like deep cuts. Right. And the other thing about BB King is he, of all the kings, he's the best singer. He is such an amazing singer. His range, he would hit these really high notes and he would do these riffs, like gospel singer riffs, uh, in in the higher range, even in his later okay. years. Like he doesn't get enough credit for the singer that he was. I don't think he he was good. I got to see you know him several times. And my problem, my favorite one is he did a birthday bash into Orpheum in Memphis, and it was a bunch of artists came in and did a B, one of their songs, one of BB songs, and then everybody got together at the end. Uh, nice. And to see him with all these, you know, it, it ranged from like Slash to Al Green to uh, Jeff Healy and Boz Skaggs. It was this crazy ensemble, but then. You know, you put them next to BB and we're like, well, that's BB. You know, that's a whole nother level. He's a whole lane of his own, a whole league of his own. Yeah. So, so we go from, from classical piano, you know, you were heavily influenced by your dad, who I know is a musician. And I love uh, some of the band names, Blue Mist and yeah. uh, the Seeds of, what was it? Seeds of, I don't have it in my notes. Seeds of Fulfillment. I love that band name. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He, he, uh. He's a really good band leader. He's not just a great musician. He's a great band leader. He taught me how to be a band leader. Taught me so how to like handle like a business. So and, tell uh, tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, that's that's an important part. We just so I do a lot of jams, and we just had one yesterday. And it's funny where you'll get somebody up who's a really good player, but does not work well in a, a band situation. You know, somebody woodsheds all the time. You know, yep. tell me your experience with that. Of you know, you have to merge those two together. Yes. to really make it happen yeah you have to just like honestly the the only thing you have to do is just remember that everybody who works with you is a human like it's it's that simple i mean a lot of people have a really hard time doing that a lot of people are not very empathetic not very considerate don't like they're only thinking about themselves but if you honestly just lead the band from a place of like imagine if i was being hired for this band like, 
how would I want this band to be run? Right. I mean, yeah. nobody ever goes that far. And the only person who ever taught me that was my dad. He's like, look, Rodney, because Rodney played with my dad, by the way, in Blue Mist. Uh, my drummer, my current drummer played with my dad for 25 years in the band Blue Mist and also various other projects. And then my dad retired and I hired him. So for example, Rodney, Rodney is a human being. He has a wife and children and grandchildren. He has a day job. You know, he, he likes his day job. He gives him steady cash and he likes everyone he works with. It's like, so I'm not going to be booking gigs at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday for $75. Right. You know what I mean? I'm going to yeah. take that solo, that gig that I could only pay him $75. I'm not going to pay anybody anything. And I'm going to bring out this solo show that I've spent my own independent time working on so that I wouldn't have to call up all of these humans who have lives and bills to pay to come and do things with me for my music and my project. You know, right? it's like, my dad was like, in order to have a successful band, you have, it has to just be you. It has to be like your name. Like there's no the somethings. He's like, it needs to just be you. But at the same time, if you're going to do that, you have to do that. You have to get all the gigs. You have to have the rehearsal space. You have to write all the songs. You have to write the checks. You have to have the van to go on tour. You have to buy all the plane tickets. You have to pay every time, every time. And if you can't pay, you pay out of, you don't pay. You do it yourself. You can't pay, you don't hire. And he's like, so if you're going to do this, you have to do it all the way. You need to have a solo show, a duo show, a trio, a, qu or a quartet. He's like, you need to be able to play your music anyway so that when somebody offers you some low amount of money, but you want to take the gig anyway, you don't got to call up the bass player and waste their time. Well, in the business part, and you know, being in Nashville, which is a music industry town, you know, there's a business side that you need to think about, but also there's there's kind of the evil part of that that becomes the business becomes overshadows the music. Like I've had friends who got fired from a band because they were taller than the lead singer and stuff like that. To your point, it doesn't become about the people you're with; it becomes about some featured act and things like that. And you can, you know, it's 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 a line. You know, and, and, you know, I think some people, you know, see it as fuzzy, but it's not, it's really not to your point. Don't be a jerk. You know, yeah. And treat other people <laughs> nicely. <laughs> and also like that whole thing, people were fired from the band because they were too tall. Yeah. I understand the mainstream industry is really shallow and oftentimes really dumb. And honestly, right now it's eating its own tail and deservedly so. But what I'm trying to say is if the entire time that you were building your project, you were the one paying for everything and taking all the bullets and then the, the label that you're working with is giving you a great opportunity, but they really want to put you with a different band. If you had been doing it yourself that whole time and paying everyone up to that point and all those people all had to do was show up to the gig, then, then they're not getting fired from the band. They're just right. not going to get called anymore. Sure. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, you, yeah. if you put it up this way to where you're, everyone you work with creatively gets paid for their time, nobody owns anything except for you. Right. And nobody can tell you what decisions to make, and there's no hard feelings. That brace player you worked with for a few years got paid to do some gigs, but you moved on. It's okay. Right. It was a fun three years. It was good for <laughs> you know well, I mean? Yeah. The bass player wrote some of the songs, and also it was the bass player's idea to uh, have the band all wear these clothes. And, you know, like, there was no creative investment from that player. They were paid for their time. Sure. Yeah, that's, be, that's they, full of hired guns Yo, yeah they, exactly. they, they know why they're there you know why they're there they are being creative and they're and they're brilliant but they also are just they're just getting paid and at the end of the gig they're just going to pack up their shit and go home yeah. yep. <laughs> and they're be, you know the next day on paypal and it's going to be beautiful and then for the studio sessions same thing they show up and they you know you tell them hey can you get a little funky with it they get a little funky with it you know like my dad told me that like the longest bands, the, lo the longest lasting bands are the ones that are artist centric with well treated, well paid hired guns. Right. And you can go a long way with that. Yeah, you know, there's, yeah, you know, like I love guys like, you know, Steve Luthaker and stuff like that. And Brent, you know, here in town, we have a guy named Brent Mason who's on everything. Uh, Jack Pearson, Tim Pierce, these guitarists who have played on everything. And, and they know, and they show up and they do their job and they get paid for it and they're perfectly happy. 
Yeah, and they make a great living. Yeah. This is this is the side of music that nobody talks about. Everyone's like, oh, you're not as famous as Beyonce. You must be a failure. What's your real job? Like, this is the side of music that nobody even understands. There's like 10,000 jobs within music. Right. Like, you could, there's so many, you could open up a music store. Like, there's literally like, you can open a venue. You can like, oh my God, it's like, my dad well, showed me. My dad showed me that like, you can work in music and do something that you love to do because you obviously love music and you can be, you can be that for a living and that's all you do. Right. You can't. And, and people don't understand that because they don't see it. All they see is, you know, Taylor Swift and they think, well, if I can't sell 200,000 tickets to the Philadelphia stadium, I must be a failure. Right. Well, and it's just different levels. And, and now like even with YouTube, I have a couple of artists here that have very uh uh big youtube channels and they don't really tour that often and they don't you know they they don't put out a lot of albums because they're like listen i make a i make great money doing this doing you know their own thing backing tracks stuff like that you know they review a lot of stuff and they just have a great following um you know so there's so many new avenues that i think it's great that you know it used to be that you know a handful of people had the key, keys to the kingdom in the old days and now it's a little bit more even. Yeah, that, that's why that's why the mainstream industry is eating its own tail. Very true. So they're trying to hold that infrastructure, and they're spending <laughs> a lot of money trying to hold it up, and it's not working. Well, you know, Blockbuster tried until the day, last day as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's like if you're going to go down, you're going to go down swinging, right? So I do want to, yeah. Uh, like I said, I got turned on to you and I love, obviously my stuff is very, the guitar centric stuff, you know, joy and those types of things, you know, you make me feel and witchcraft are my favorites. And then my, my girlfriend, Amanda loves your bluesier stuff. She loves to love transcends album and rolling on and things like that. You have this, this, this wide spectrum. So you go from classical piano, you know, and then you go into guitar, you get into blues guitar, but the, you know, like when people say, I, I try to, you know, I say, you got to go listen to Jackie Vincent. They're like, what's she like? And I'm like, I don't even know how to tell you. Yeah. So what do you say? <laughs> Just go listen. I would say uh, rock, pop, R&B, reggae, blues. But if you don't like rock, you're not going to like it. You, and have, I th you have to like rock on some level. Right. You have to like either rock blues or rock pop or rock, like, if you don't like rock, it's going to hit you in the face and it's just going to keep on smacking you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's fair enough. Like, like that ending riff on witchcraft. I love that riff. That's like, a, that's a nice if jam. If you don't like rock, can you li listen to witchcraft? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you can listen to, you know, rolling on and you make me feel, you know, I think the last person I was trying to describe you to, I said, I said, there's like, there's some buddy guy in there. There's some, yeah. maybe some Eric Johnson a little bit in there as, as, as well, or at least that kind of style of playing. Uh, and I said, you know, maybe some prints, a little funky every now and then here and there. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's all in there. <laughs> Here's the thing, Rolling On and Make Me Feel are also rock songs. Like the, yeah. really intense. Like rock is not a, a chord progression. Rock is not a tempo. It's not a key. It's not even an instrumentation. It just needs to really just have distortion of some sort and a drum kit. Right. I think the only requirement for rock is a drum kit, like a snare drum with sticks no brushes sticks loud like that that's those are the two requirements if it's not a drum kit and if it's not loud it's not rock and i'm not saying loud as in undynamic right no i mean big well like, it's one of those things like like the reason i love that riff at in a witchcraft you can't not bang yeah. your head when, when you hear that you're like you're, that's when rock like i know it's rock when it makes i can't even voluntarily stop it it's just happens well, think about Think about like rolling on where it's like bum bum bum. That's rock, man. Oh. The, that, and then like solo, the guitar solo that's like really big with the electric distorted guitar, dude. That's rock. So, I you know I was I you know when I first introduced you, like I do like everything. I go and look at all the stuff, and I saw like stuff from five years ago where it's you and a Strat and a PV Classic, you know, fifty. It looked like. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And then and then the evolution to now, which is. You know, it looks like you're, you're, you know, doing Epiphones and Kemplers and the samplers, stuff like that. How, how did that transition happen? What, what moved you into kind of how you're playing and performing now? Uh, touring. And okay. Is that just easier to have, you know, cause I can, you can, you know, have just a drummer and a sampler and do that. 
Well, that that's just the tip of the iceberg. The Kemper is for consistency of sound, plus the Kemper sounds better than an amp. It sounds better, and also I sound the same at in Alaska as I do in Germany. Right. Um, this is the Alaska amp has been sitting out in the humidity all day, so this show my guitar is going to sound muddy, but the German amp is fine tuned, so this show it's going to sound clean. Oh, but the um, Minnesota Minneapolis amp that that was backlined, that one the tubes were old, so it's going to be buzzy. But then, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just like Kemper, 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 Kemper every gig. Right. You well, know? and I, you know, and I, I've. I think I've went full circle. Like when I first started, I couldn't afford. Like so, I had I had a, a gorilla amp was my first amp. And this is crappy little state of the art. And then I, you know, eventually moved into tubes and I had a PV Classic Thirty and a Blues Junior. But then I got tired of hauling stuff around. And to your point, like you know, plugging that PV Classic Thirty in and some smoke coming out. Yeah. Then what do you do? Then you have to yeah. use like your friend's like solid state in the back of the closet, maybe. And then it's like you got to go from a tube amp to a solid state like ten minutes before your gig starts. It's like nope nope well and here in nashville and downtown there's so much live music going on and they're swapping people in and out they don't even have amps on stage everybody is using modelers either floor ones or something like that uh just because it's so much easier and to your point it's consistent and also you know especially because i i know you have like a very eclectic sound there's lots of different sounds coming in there being able to just step on one thing and say do all of this and here's a scene and here's this setup yeah you know, it's, it's just so convenient and you know, yeah, if you really, really listen, you might listen to it, but 99.9% .9 of the people don't care. <laughs> yeah, no, the only people who know are the people who read about it beforehand. Absolutely nobody knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it sounds good, it is good. <laughs> you wouldn't know what it was if you didn't read an interview or look me up. Right. You would just think it was like just a really sick sounding electric guitar, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So what? So I, I was reading the Guitar World interview and, and about that transition from Strats to to Epiphones, and it sounded like it was kind of one just how it set with you, but then also like moving to humbuckers and getting a little bit of that that girth to the sound, getting that punch. Yeah, no, the humbuckers. I'm never going back. I was actually introduced to humbuckers on a Strat on this white Strat I used to. It's like a white and black Strat with a Texas flag on it. Um, I played it on Live in Texas and also the Joy Alive at the Paramount Theater, um, which is on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah, that was the Strat, and that's also the Strat I recorded Vintage Machine on, as well as the original iteration of Joy. Um, also, the Love Sweet Limited release was recorded with that Strat. Strat's a really great studio guitar, I'm not going to lie. Uh, really, really great for the studio. You can change the sound to whatever you want, and the noiseless pickups are nice because you don't have like all that crap to deal with afterwards and mixing but the Kemper gets rid of all of that you know so like anything wrong with a humbucker the Kemper smooths it out and it just like brings out all the best things about it it's like it brings out the gain without the noise it brings the volume without the the harshness the edge it's it's so great and and it's so much better than noiseless for what I'm trying to do I'm literally playing rock so I need like loud I need loud I need in your face I need cutting, I need lead, and I need smooth, like this smooth, where I can do like hammer-ons and stuff, and it's just this smoothness right. that's like kind of inexplicable, and uh, also impossible for a Strat to recreate, even if you put humbuckers in it. It's about the bolt-on thing versus the one single piece of wood. It's also the scale of the neck. It's yeah. just... Scientifically speaking, the two sound the way they sound because of how they're built, and neither of them can sound like each other. <laughs> it's just how it is. Like, it just neither of them are better or worse than each other. It's it's all about what tool you need for your sound. And right. the same cut with the humbuckers and the in the smaller neck. If I'm playing leads, man, that's what I need. Well, when I've watched you, when I've watched you play, you are you are fiddling with everything all the time. Like you're switching in between in mid riff yeah. sometimes, you know. Because the because the tones, the tones in a humbucker, the combinations, they're night and day. It's like I'm it's like I'm putting on a different guitar. And then sometimes I want like one note to be soft. I want the higher notes to be on the warmer pickups, and then I want the lower notes that that'll interfere with the bass frequencies. I want them to be on the bridge pickups so that I take away the bassiness. 
of the you know the neck pickup right so if i'm playing like a solo and i want to play low notes but there's bass going on you know i need to cancel out i need to take out the low note frequencies but be able to still play the note so i then i switch to the bridge pickup which makes the whole thing more shallow i also um move my picking hand a little farther to where i'm over that pickup instead of over the neck pickup right um, but that's like at the end of make me feel when I'm playing those low notes, because it sounds like a human voice, like talking, right down th- down there. And the higher notes, it sounds like fucking angel trumpets. <laughs> low note, the low notes of the guitar when used in solos sound like chitter chatter, like and so it's like the solo becomes like a conversation, right. To that point, so another part of your style is singing and playing the medley, uh, the uh, a vocal medley at the same time together. Uh, how did that evolve? Well, it started off, um, I just always had a shitty monitor situation, like just the worst monitor situations you can imagine. And I could never hear myself. And then I would hear, I would watch the Instagram stories after the show and I'd be pitchy and I just, and it's like, how do you control pitch? if you can't hear yourself, if like you can feel the notes exiting your mouth, but all you can hear is drum noise and snare noise and just, and the monitor guy, every time he tries to turn it up, he doesn't know what he's doing. Cause I'm not, this is not Coachella. This is like some dive bar outside of Austin. Um, doesn't know what they're doing. So like every time they try to turn it up even a little bit, it feeds back. These were the right. days of like, not nice venues. Like I had to just get whatever gig I could get. Right. And the terrible or they were mediocre at best. And the sound, some sound places didn't have monitors. But well, we're an acoustic video, you know? You could just kind of like hear it bouncing off the wall. I'm like, have you ever even stood in the same room with a drum kit? I'm not hearing shit bouncing off shit, man. Right. I'm not hearing anything. All I'm hearing is psh, psh, even the most dynamic drummer. This is a loud instrument to be standing right. next to. So like, yes, I need this speaker to give me information (laughs) and like this was years i had to deal with this before the venues finally got nicer years i had to deal with this and so i would start so that i could get my pitch right know that i was singing the right melody i would double it with the guitar and then it started just turning into its own thing but it started off as just i need to hear myself i need to match pitch i need to (laughs) I need to not sound like crap, and I need to, like, not be a bad singer, dude. Well, it's, that's so interesting that it was, you know, a very practical need for it that turns into kind of a, a an integration of your style. And then I think to we just we were talking about, you know, melo- being very melodic, still rocking, but still being melodic, that you can, you know, like, I think I was talking to somebody yesterday. They were talking about, I go, I go with the Neil Sean way of soloing. You play, play the medley twice, you know, yeah. and, then, and then you shred, and that's your yeah. solo. Yeah. And I think because you're already coming from the medley, you've already been playing the medley for pretty much the whole time, and yeah, you can exactly. slide right into that, you know, metal medley, and then the shredding part, and back and forth, which you seem to kind of add into effortlessly. Well, because it started off as a desperate plea to <laughs> sing on pitch in front of people and not be filmed in the age of the internet as a person who can't hold pitch. Because I can hold pitch, I just can't hold pitch when I. Can't you can't hear, hear yourself, yeah. It's like I can't hear. You remember when Adele stopped the entire TV show and they went to commercial break because they couldn't because she couldn't hear herself. Well, it's That's- because you know you're you're right. Like there is the famous um, oh when Taylor Swift sang with Stevie Nicks and yeah. and she did she sang off pitch, but I'm like, listen, she probably couldn't hear herself. You know, I yeah, you know, she could probably sing fine, but you okay. do, you take the best singer and put them in some place where they can't hear themselves and it. You don't know what, what you're going to get. Yeah, what are they? I mean, some of them are so great that no matter what, it's like the muscle memory is just wow. Now, I'm talking about like the, the Whitney Houstons of the world. Um, yeah, that rarefied. <laughs> rarefied, like the people who become superstar singers. They know how to deal with this in their own way. Um, like gospel singers and stuff, because they're, they're used to being in big choir situations and churches, a lot of chaos, you know? So some people that come up, singing in church choirs like that they know how to deal with this too they know how to like maybe like feel with vibrations if they're on the right key that's not my background man my background is piano and then 
guitar and then the singing was just my dad telling me if you want to make any money as an artist you got to start right. singing and so i just started singing yeah. because otherwise i'd have to hire a singer you know what i'm saying like i'm right. like okay i definitely sing well enough to be able to just like sing along and and have this still be about the songs and about the guitar and stuff so but like i said it started off as just like a desperate grasp to, to not be considered a pitchy singer and then turned into this thing that kind of like everybody is obsessed with now <laughs> um but i do it now because it's fun because the guitar can do riffs that i'm not capable of doing on my own right so i get to like live i get to riff vicariously through the guitar whenever i don't do that doubling thing like if if i were a person who could sing the way that i could riff on the guitar like just i wouldn't need the guitar dude i'd be like a superstar singer i'd be, I'd be like, I'd be like, dude. I'd be like, <laughs> I'm serious about that. If if I yeah. had natural thing, the way that I do with instruments, I'd be in a. We'd be having a totally different interview right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but with, it, the, with the guitar, I'm able to reach those riffs. I can just kind of like ride along with it. Like like the guitar is Superman, and I'm just like Lois Lane holding on to it. You know, well, and you have an extra backup singer, basically. I, I also harmonize. I constantly, yeah. constantly, I'll split off and harmonize with the note that I'm playing on the guitar. I do that all the time. That is so fun. And it's easier for me to hold pitch because I can feel the pitch against the frequency of the guitar note as well. Like, right. you know, when like a, it's when a pitch is off beyond just being able to hear it, you can feel you it. You feel too. it. Yeah. Vibration of a clash. And so that's why it helps me stay on pitch so much when I'm, when I sing with it, you know, it also, is like an undertone to my voice. So it's like adding an element to my voice that nobody else has. Right. You know, like it, I have on my own, I, I think I have a really cool and unique and very nice voice, but there's a billion people out there who have a really cool and unique, very nice voice. There's nobody else out there who opens their mouth and a part of their voice is an electric guitar. I see right. it as a way to completely stand out. Well, and I, I know it got you noticed by Frampton, who is also a guy who you know, usually plays that way. Uh, yeah. I was just recently, Eric Gales played here in Nashville and Frampton was in the audience and Eric Gales afterwards was like, I was so nervous the whole time because I'm playing in front of Peter Frampton. But one of your your uh, celebrity fans that I was impressed with is Vernon Reed because I love Vernon yeah. Reed. I'm I'm stoked about that. He's a and he's also just a really really great like soul. And he's just a great person. And because he's another guy who's a very unique playing style that that you know at some point in time people are like, oh my god, that's just noise. And I'm like, no, try to play that noise. Yeah, it is not just noise. Fuck. That's how, that's how, that's what I always said about rap. I'm like, oh, it's easy. Do it. Yeah, do it. Do it. You know, I right can do now. what Eminem does. Okay, go do it. Do it. Actually, just recite one of his songs. Never mind writing it. Just recite it. No. Go. <laughs> you know, like uh, that was always my argument for rap and hip hop and stuff. But anyways, uh, yeah, no, that's really exciting. And um, I'm going to play in New York and I think he might come to the show. So I'm excited. Oh, that would be, that would be amazing. Hopefully you guys record that. Cause I would love to see that. Cause I've seen like the stuff with you and Gary Clark Jr. I know you did that. And did, and did you had this string? I saw like Jason L. Dean and Tim McGraw and open it up for oh, them and yeah. James Taylor. Yeah. That was like a, a thing I won in 2014. It was, it was a part of this department store called Belk. Yeah. They, they had this like thing where they, decided to like have an audition process and pick like five musicians or five bands to go on a summer tour and also be like wearing their threads and like playing on their sponsored stage. But like they'd pay you for the shows and they would cover all your expenses. It was the first tour I ever went on. It was in 2014 and I was still playing the acoustic guitar. I had not learned how to play like a solo electric set yet because I was still using loopers. Right. I used loopers five years before I got to that sampler, by the way. Um, yeah, so these were still in the looping days. I didn't have a band. I auditioned solo and won it solo, so they didn't let me bring a band. They're like, we picked you solo, so you're solo. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just take all the money. That's fine. Shit. And the reason why I didn't bring a band is because it was at 10 a.m. on a Monday, the audition, and right. they all have to up. They all have to up. 
And um, so, yeah, I just went on this whole, my first tour I ever went on, it was solo. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting. I was like, that, that's an interesting lineup. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was like these tailgate parties, you know, they would have like a day party before the show. Right. So we would play like the day party. Gotcha. So who, you know, you know you've t done the tour with, you know, Gary Clark. Um, I know you did some stuff with Melissa Etheridge. You know, who would be like, if you got to choose who you could go and, you know, pal around with and tour with, who would you want it to be? That's a really hard qu question to answer because like, like really famous musicians are extremely hit or miss. But I mean, just even stylistically, like I would love to play with that person. Cause you know, when you tour with somebody, usually there's the thing where they bring you out and you get to play with together like that, that I would, I feel like I'd meld with that person. I think genre wise and, and live stage sound wise, I think me going on like a 10 or 20 date, I do soul support for Alicia Keys. Would okay. Be absolutely crazy. I feel like I'm like if Alicia Keys played the electric guitar. So now, you like did stuff, you like her when you were doing piano? Was she an influence on piano as well? I mean, she's amazing. Right. So she dominated my teenage years. All like she had like 20 hits. Like between ages for me, between ages like 13 to 25 i think alicia keys had two hits a year <laughs> right well well and it's you know it, you you think about like uh like nuno betancourt playing for rihanna you know and yeah. you know because he's one of my favorites and just like when i first heard like playing for rihanna really and then i watched some of the shows and i'm like okay no i can see that that's I mean, it's possible that's I have great energy music but it's not dance club music like rihanna's always been like dance hall dance club electronic edm um like with a tinge of like r&b and hip-hop and i have r&b but it's still my stuff is pretty bandy well you got the jackie the robot all the no, remixes you're talking about jackie right now. <laughs> you're talking about who, what i open for okay that's true that's true very true so, that's not fair my my music is real bandy it's like a, right a, a, right so like I would actually probably musically fit in better opening for, if we're talking about superstar women right now, um, I would fit the best with Alicia Keys because Alicia, okay. Keys is a, Alicia Keys is a lead singer, songwriter who plays the piano, and then she has a band. She right. has back drummer and bass players, and she has a music director. It's a band. Like, that's what I do right. on a way smaller scale and with the electric guitar instead. Right. So... Yeah, Alicia Keys would be like a perfect match. Her fans would love my music. I'm sure of it. It would meld in there. Yes. What's what's as as you've been you know uh, getting all these opportunities and things like that? You know, it always seems like on, on that rise up. There's there's a point where you're like you're in that moment. And you go, I can't believe I'm here. You know, yeah, yeah, it's know. pretty weird sometimes. Yeah, it gets it gets like that sometimes. But I try not to pay too much attention to it. <laughs> Because the moment ends, and when it ends, True. It's like, I can't believe it's over, and then it's really depressing. I think there it's, was... it's like not the reality. So, like, let's say hypothetically speaking, you're you're an artist, and you've been working your project, and you've gotten to the point where you're in Cancun, Mexico, um, and you get to either sit in with or open for Melissa Etheridge every night. And you got paid and your rooms are right on the resort and you're doing it in like, it's like, whoa, right? But then the gig ends. And then the next gig after that is like a coffee shop gig in like Omaha, Nebraska. Well, and that's, you know, the, the gig is, you know, 60 to 90 minutes max. And then there's all the stuff in between it that has to happen. And, and and the day creeps in. Adrian Blue had a thing about he played at the Grammys with Bowie and said, an hour later, I was changing the cat litter. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. It's like you can't get focused on it because it's like teeny, teeny, tiny moments. It never is. It never stays. I, I, I wonder what it's like for people who are superstars. It's it means that they're always in that moment. That's what I'm assuming. Like, if they're a superstar like Rihanna or Beyonce, I assume that they're always in that moment, that, like, the Grammys end and then they go back to their $30 million estate. Like, they're always 
in that moment. The the big the big huge like Taylor Swift, the nine hundred million dollar grossing tour ends, and now she's like, okay, which private jet started by next? <laughs> yes, but to, I to live in in that bigness. Whereas like the people who support Taylor Swift, her band, yeah, they go home and they have to like empty their bathroom trash can. You know I'm thinking. I'm, I'm thinking more like the musical thing of where like this is going. So yeah, I mean, you don't have to be at those levels of just. There's opportunities you get as any level as a musician, to where you know. So you know, we we were uh, um, at the that night at Papa T's. Uh, you didn't get to make it out to the jam. I wish you had because it was a great night. It was a packed house because it's right on the water. And people are just coming off their boats in there, and uh, they have a jam. And I played there you know for years. And that night, just it hit the the guys who got up with me. We all knew each other, so we could kind of play off each other a little bit. The crowd loved it. I do a version of No Diggity, and this crowd just really got into it. Was singing it back to me, uh, and it's like that. But those, I'm like, all right, this is why I love this. This is why I do it. And I don't because I don't do it professionally. I'm a I'm a hobbyist musician. But yo, know, like you said, it's not always going to be Coachella. And I love that Coachella is like your like that's the bar. <laughs> it's Everything not else the bar. is not Coachella. <laughs> It's not, it's not the bar. It's like the perceived bar. Right. You know what I mean? What I mean by that is like, if I, if I put my bar, it's not going to make sense to anybody because nobody knows my world or the business the way that you or I do. Um, I have to like put a perceived bar. And I think the perceived <laughs> bar for everybody in the United States is if you're headlining Coachella, you're huge. I think right. that's the perceived bar for just any idiot, you know, throw a rock. <laughs> that rock is a person that person knows what coachella is true very you know true I mean? like it, it's like it's not the actual bar for me i don't care if i ever play coachella in reality i don't care man i'm doing what i love i'm making a living playing my right. own music. in it's like the eight, eighth year in a row i've made a full living playing my own original music i'm already at the bar dude yeah i mean i mean that's that is hard enough in this industry yeah. you know to to do that and and you're right it is you know yeah, you, know, you get tired of hearing. So, so what do you do when this doesn't work out? Like, no, this is this is it. This is what I'm doing, no, and I'm making money, and I'm doing it. Working out, yeah. Like, <laughs> this is working out. It's like I see it as like people who haven't gone full time as a musician yet, right? I see it as like they're building a house, and you know they had to build it, they had to dig the hole, they had to get the permits. They, it's like a pitch to get to the point where you can even start laying the foundation. So I, I see it as like people just like in the grunt work of building a house. But then once somebody becomes full time and they're making a living in music, doing what they want to do, no other revenue, like it's all music. Um, I see it as they're just now the house is built and they're just living in it. And so when you when you come up to somebody and you're like, oh, so what are you going to do when this doesn't work out? Well, the house is pretty strong. I built it. <laughs> what do you mean? What am I going to do when the house doesn't work out? I'm just living in it. Right. I, just, I wake up and I'm alive in the house. It, it is working out. And to your point, everything, you know, if you think about the music that's out there and the music that's out there, a small little percentage of it are Taylor Swift and Garth Brooks and the, the names everybody knows. There's a bunch of people that are making great music. They're putting out albums. They're touring. You know, they are, are making a sustainable living. And, and, you know, how much of how you can get to that, that little, most of that's luck. Oh, that's just timing and luck and things like that. What helps sustain the middle is like you said, you know, talent obviously, but hustle and just gumption and 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 putting in the work. Yeah, but it's like it's fun work, you know. Yeah. Even if I'm playing the farmer's market gig for 150 bucks, shit, man, I made 600 bucks in tips. I got some free corn. <laughs> uh, like who, who's losing here? You don't get All free corn at Coachella. No, you sure you don't. don't. You don't at all. Probably get other stuff. That's they really step. <laughs> probably get like okay. a, you probably get like an iPad. And you had like, you know, like here's your Apple gift box. I think Beyonce's backstage throwing a fit. Where is my corn? I Where did not is get like, my you know, corn? Mrs. Mrs. B, Mrs. B. Um, we only have these iPads. I'm sorry. We don't have any turnips. I'm sorry. Those are out of season. Sorry, Mrs. B. Please don't release the hive on me. So here's here's one last important question for you. Uh, wrap up. Uh, why did Jackie and the gents break up? What happened? <laughs> well, the bass player and the drummer went to college out of state. 
and um, the guitar player decided he didn't want to be a guitar player anymore. And uh, the keyboard player ended up getting a really great job at a bank. And so Jackie, there was this, there was this high school or college? This was high school. Though. High, was, high school. I don't know if that's how everybody actually turned out. That was a joke. <laughs> but the joke is we were all 15 and we grew up. <laughs> But was that, I mean, were you singing in that one or were you just playing, you know, you're, you're, the, yeah, it's got your name on it. So I was assuming so. Was okay. that kind of your first, I'm the band leader, I'm, I'm fronting this band, I'm doing that? Absolutely. So I had done this program when I was, my dad signed me up to be in this program called Soul Tree Collective, totally unrelated to Jackie the Jets. Signed me up to be in this program when I was like 16, 15 or something. The whole purpose of the band was to like help the youths, you know, get into music they would provide us a rehearsal space and they also gave us like a six month rehearsal time and then we would play this really cool show so we had something to work towards it was like this program to just help kids be in a band in a safe environment and like get that experience which really really great um but i was the keyboard player of that band and they wouldn't let me sing they wouldn't let me sing not even backups they're like just play keyboards and i was like Ugh. and i just knew i could sing good enough i'm like i could I'm not Whitney Houston, but I could like sing and play and it could be nice. I've seen, you know, like Nora Jones can do it. You know, Nora Jones isn't out there belting out Whitney Houston riffs and look at her. She's doing great. Her music's great. I could do this. You know, like I just, I was mad that they wouldn't let me sing. I'm like, I can do this. And so after that whole program ended, I started my own band and it was called Jackie and the Gents. And what? I didn't play keyboards at all. I hired a keyboard player. I was like, you just saying? I was PTSD from the not <laughs> thing and then making me only play the keyboard. I was like, no keyboard. I'm like, I'm just going to be the front. So I'm going to be the star. I'm like, you know, and it ended up being weird. I ended up learning that performing with an instrument is kind of my calling, whether it be the piano or just performing with an instrument is my calling. And Jackie and the gents taught me that. Well, it's a thing. Anytime I've sang and not had an instrument in my hands, I don't know what to do. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not smooth enough to kind of, it's I a, have to have an anchor. If I could, if I could sing exactly on, if I could like sing and riff and stuff the same way that I could play on the guitar, um, yeah, I would just get lost in what I was doing. If I could just like close my eyes and just access these riffs, are you kidding me? My hands, I would probably just end up doing cool stuff, but nobody would care because it would just be like angelic noise coming there out of my go. mouth. Like if you watch Whitney Houston, she's like this, and she does things with her hands and then sometimes she'll just have her hands by her side but you don't notice because it's like holy right. crap like godly noise just coming out of her vocal cords and you just don't care and everything she does is majestic because she sounds so majestic and so i'm convinced that if i was like that level of singer i wouldn't need an instrument that's just what i would be doing i would just be doing that but then you wouldn't be you and you know I there like being me, but I'm just like, <laughs> like a different timeline, multiverse version of me, the one that sings like Whitney Houston. Yeah, she's like, nah, I don't need all that. Check this out. And then I just open my mouth. <laughs> Whoa. And just sing the national anthem and lay it yeah, down. I just like do like a church riff and then like record it on my phone and then play it back and harmonize with the riff. Like, I've seen people do that at Berkeley. These types of singers were at Berkeley. Oh, yeah. There, like that, it's... Top 1%, that top 1% that like gets on the voice. Yeah, they were at Berkeley in troves. And it is, you know, it's it's a thing where, especially in your music towns, and if you're in the music industry, and not that I'm in the music industry, but I'm around it a lot. And there's people, I'm like, you're a good singer. But, you know, and, and it's, and, and it's, there's just something, there's an X factor that you're like, but that. So like uh, uh, Lake Street Dive and, and, and Rachel from Lake Street Dive, just her voice is just like, that's a whole nother thing. It's just yeah. amazing and things like that. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's, it, you know, so it's, 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 and it's a thing, you know. Anybody can even dream of singing even half as well as Wendy Moten. Like there, there's just a whole other level where like, it doesn't make any sense, but it's, I promise you, you have to be born with it. It's not something that can be developed. It's something that, needs to be developed if you are born with it right 
but you can't like be born, not have it, and then decide at age ten you want to be like Wendy Moten. Well, and also, no. I mean, it's a physical thing in your body. You know, like a guitar. <laughs> you and I can play the same guitar, so at least we have that starting with us. Now it's going to sound a lot better when you do it. But you know, that's then the part of uh, there. But with a with a, with your vocal core, I mean, that's just you know, like I I no matter what you do with me, I have that much range. You know, now I can learn how to use that range to my advantage and apply it to the songs. I make song selections. I'm like, ooh, no, we're going to move that down yeah. to F. Yep. You, you, know. can, you can make informed decision based on your limitations that you were, like, born with. You, this is what I'm trying right. to say. Those types of singers, you don't learn that. You are born with the ability to do that, and then you develop it. Right. You don't. You don't, like turn 15 decide you want to try to go sing like that start taking voice lessons and then and then you have it like no right. it was there it just hadn't come out yet nobody yeah. nobody refi released it yeah almost every single one of the singers that i meet like that started singing before they were like five oh. like not even just in, not like in church sometimes in church but like just around the house like they just all it just it had to come out you know what i'm saying like no. like it's just <laughs> It's a very mysterious thing, and and it's and it blesses all sorts of people. It's not it's not ever just one type of person. It's not ever just women or just men or just or just you know binary whatever cisgendered. It's like you never know who it's going to touch. You can never tell when someone's going to open their mouth and just be that right. kind of thing. You never know, and you can't know. And that's my favorite thing. Like some some person walks in, they're like ten years old, they're this big, they're scrawny, and then they open their mouth and they're Michael Jackson. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like my favorite thing about that kind of singing you never know who can do it it, <laughs> you know, it could either be Wendy Moten or Joss Stone or Stevie Wonder or six-year-old Michael Jackson you just never know right it could be anybody. It could be anybody it's like this crazy lottery that that people win you know so it wrap it up I want to be uh, a good steward of your time so uh you know who are you listening to now like who's you know, and in the studio hole producing Jackie the Robot tracks. Okay. I've been listening to hip hop nonstop. Okay. And I don't know exactly who I've been listening to. I know that it's just been an intersection of like Kendrick Lamar, um, Dreamville, uh, J. Cole, and a crap load of Chicago female rappers that I can't get the names of right now, but one of them is called No Name. <laughs> Her stage name is literally No Name. Um, but there's like so there's like a Chicago female rapper renaissance going on right now. Seriously, people aren't talking about it because it's women, but it's happening. Okay. Yeah, look up Chicago rappers who specifically are women, and there's like they're brilliant, and they're all in. It's it's crazy. It, there's a renaissance happening right now that nobody's talking about. <laughs> the revolution I'm... will not be televised. <laughs> what? <laughs> Whitey's on the moon. Uh... <laughs> Look. Definitely turn my so my son came out to to see the show, uh, and he is exploring everything. Like he just started picking up bass. He did flute. He did his guitar, and he he is you know I used to think I was eclectic, and that kid is eclectic. And uh, so you know he is he is the person who is usually using I'm using to turn me on to things because he, he 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 won't listen to my music. He doesn't want to listen to boomer music, so he always plugs in when we drive anywhere, uh, and it is just like all over the place um so i, I i'm gonna I, i'm gonna have him research for me because he will he'll find it all for me uh so there's another jackie the robot coming out this uh, be the well, third one is this this will be my my i relaunched the project okay um, I took down all the previous ones because they were all released under the jackie vincent profile okay now i want jackie the robot to be their own artist gotcha so what i'm doing is i am re-releasing some of the projects I did back then, but I'm starting out with a brand new one called Automated Bliss. That comes out on June 9th. Okay. And is that going to be some be of the re-release stuff? No, this is brand new Jackie brand the Robot. Brand new stuff. Okay. Brand new Jackie, Jackie the Robot. Robot. It's a remix of Joy. And it's also, um, it's also like this trancey, psychedelic thing. And uh, it comes out June 9th, and it's being released under Jackie the Robot's profile. So it's okay. instead of finding it through Jackie the Vince, Jackie Vince, you type in Jackie the Robot. This isn't a Chris Gaines, Garth Brooks thing. And we're going to have to interview with, like, separately Jackie the Robot. Is it a different persona you have to leave and come back? No, it's not a different persona. <laughs> it's 
to come back in person. If it's a grand persona that I have to separate on the internet because right. people who like guitar music don't typically like EDM. So. Right. Keep yeah. keep the brand separate. I get it. So right. what are you working on next for Jackie Vincent? Okay, so Jackie Vincent is coming out with Ghost in the Machine, which is a complete overhaul and then also like uh, extension of Vintage Machine. It's going to be totally re-recorded Vintage Machine as well as unplugged versions of all of the songs as well. And then an extended outro that gives you more view into all of the demos that went into the songs, like the baby versions of the songs, basically. So it's just going to be a more robust Vintage Machine that comes out on October 30th. And then next year, I'm going to come out with a brand new album, brand new music called The Love Anthology. That's going to come out next fall, 2024. And then after that, I'm going to come out with uh, Latest Hits, and that's going to be 2025. You've got it all plotted out. You do have your dad's business sense. <laughs> well, because i got to record them, and it takes like six months to a year to record an album if you want to really do it justice, especially if it's like a 10 or 15 track album. So, uh, yeah love anthology i just got done recording and now i'm gonna have to start setting my sights on recording uh latest hits and are you doing that uh you know in austin texas you do, do you have a home recording studio or are you doing a studio there in austin i split my time sometimes I, I record some stuff at home and some stuff in the studio i usually like to do vocals in the studio because they have access to better microphones than i do because uh, i don't want to go down the rabbit hole of buying microphones um but all the direct instruments like I, I record the Kemper at home it's no problem it's studio guitar already and Jackie the Robot I do completely at home because it's all electronic direct instruments or a guitar which is also direct right yep. well great and then you're, you're you've got you know a lot of dates coming up I was just seeing seeing those you're not coming back to Nashville for all but that's okay we'll, we'll review <laughs> that when you get back here. well at least you got to see the the last show I did and the next time you're in I'm, I'm gonna be there Jackie, thank you so much for you know being gracious with your time and spending all this time and letting us you know weave through all the sorts of different things. <laughs> it was it was nice talking to you, man. We we covered a lot of bases. We did, and so everybody go check Jackie out. She's going to be you know all this. You just heard all the great music. There's a ton of great music to go and listen to already because oh, it's yeah. a, you're almost on ten years for the uh, the Light and Me right. Next yeah. year will be the tenth year of that one. So you've got you've got all that ten years, and we've got a plan for a whole bunch of new coming out, and so yeah. check it out. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>